Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Give Chelsea a big clap. She's awesome. So Chelsea was raised up in our church in Grand Prairie. Uh, Jan, why don't you get up and take a spin as well? This is my wife, Jan. Uh, my British bride. And uh, we've been married 34 years and pastored church in Grand Prairie. We started that church in 1995. And Chelsea was a part of the church. She was on staff for a while in our praise and worship. And we, we miss you, Chelsea. We were just with your mom the other day in uh, Deadwood, Alberta. And uh, it's great to see you. And Ellen, so good to see you again. Amen, Teresa others that we know here this morning. Just treasures, treasures in our lives. Isn't that neat that we have these treasures wherever we go? Wherever we go, we walk in the room this morning and there's treasures here just waiting for us to celebrate. So we celebrate you this morning. Amen. So I'm going to ask you this morning just to take your watches off. Not many people have watches anymore. But um, you know what? We're going to finish up in due time. And we're going to let, you know the scripture about due time, huh? Do you know what I find? If you are so conscious of your time, you're not actually going to be listening to the message. Amen? Get rid of the watch on a Sunday morning and let God speak to your heart. We are here to meet with God this morning. I don't want to leave this place the same as I came. Why would we waste our time? Amen? So let's just forget about the time. God lives in timelessness. He works in timelessness. He only gave us time on the earth as long as we're here. And that doesn't mean that we don't honor time. But this morning I really have a message I feel for this church and for people that are here that need to hear this message. So if you will give me the liberty in the next 30 or so minutes, I am going to do that. And online as well. Amen? So turn, uh, we're going to turn to Hebrews 11.1. Hebrews 11, 1. And Dustin, Pastor Dustin has said, Paul, uh, bring one of your favorite scriptures. Are you on the favorite scripture uh, thing going on? Yeah. He said, bring your favorite scripture. So I'm preaching some of my favorite scriptures out of Hebrews and out of Luke uh, and some other ones as well. But Hebrews chapter 1, and I'm going to use the, today's Passion Translation. Uh, starting in verse 1, it says, Now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. I'm going to read that again. Now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. This testimony of faith is what previous generations were commended for. Faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's words. He spoke and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. Faith moved Abel to choose a more acceptable sacrifice to offer God than his brother Cain. And God declared him righteous because of his offering of faith. By this faith, uh, Abel still speaks instruction to us today even though he is long dead. Faith translated Enoch from this life, and he was taken up into heaven. He never had to experience death. He just disappeared from the world because God promoted him. How many want a promotion this morning? Amen. Maybe you'll just disappear while I'm preaching. Amen. Wow. And without faith living within us, it makes it impossible to please God. For we cannot come to God in faith knowing that he, he is real and that He rewards the faith of those who passionately seek Him. Faith opened Noah's heart to receive revelation and warnings from God about what was coming, even things that had never been seen. But he stepped out in reverent obedience to God and built an ark that would save him and his family. By his faith, the world was condemned, but Noah received God's gift of righteousness that comes from believing. 
Faith motivated Abraham to obey God's call and leave the familiar to discover the territory he was destined to inherit from God. So he left with only a promise and without even knowing ahead of time where he was going, Abraham stepped out in faith. He lived by faith as an immigrant in his promised land as though it belonged to someone else. He sojourned through the land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob who were persecuted or persuaded that they were also co-heirs of the same promise. His eyes of faith were set on the city with unshakable foundations, whose architect and builder is God himself. Sarah's faith embraced God's miracle power to conceive even though she was barren and was past the age of childbearing. For the authority of her faith rested in the one who made the promise and she tapped into his faithfulness. In fact, so many children were subsequently fathered by this aged man of faith, one who was as good as dead, that he now has offspring as innumerable as the sand on the seashore, as the stars in the sky. These heroes all died still clinging to their faith, not even receiving all that had been promised them. But they saw beyond the horizon the fulfillment of their promises and gladly embraced it from above. They all lived their faith on earth as those who belong to another realm. Isn't that a great way of looking at it? We're living on earth in our faith that we all belong to another realm that's even greater than this one. And that's really important. Amen? For clearly, those who live this way are longing for the appearing of a heavenly city. And if their hearts were still remembering what were still remembering what they left behind, they would have found an opportunity to go back. But they didn't turn back for their hearts were fixed on what was far greater. That is the heavenly realm. So because of this, God is not ashamed in any way to be called their God, for he has prepared a heavenly city for them. Wow. Amen. So Father, we thank you for the reading of your word today. And Holy Spirit, we ask for revelation of your word, that you would impart revelation, knowledge to us today that would change our lives forever. And we thank you, Lord, for doing that in your precious name. And everyone said, Amen. So I entitled my message, No Turning Back. Amen. You know, did you notice that you weren't uh, born with a rear view mirror? Have you ever thought about that? Probably didn't think about that this morning when you woke up, huh? Why wasn't I born with a rear view mirror? You know, my car has a rear view mirror. Why don't I have a rear view mirror? It's because God never intended you on living your life looking back. Amen? And so it's so important that we understand that God is in faith always is moving forward and never backwards. Amen? Faith is always moving forward. And when you and I have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we crossed over a line of no return. A line of no return. When you were born again, you stepped out of one realm into another realm. Amen? From the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom of light. You stepped over a line of no return. There's no way back. I love the story about the little boy, I think it was in England, and they had those big tall stone walls in those days uh, that they had built actually to keep the Romans out. Um, which never defeated the northern side of England. Uh, they kept the Romans out that way. But the kid was going to school or whatever, and he had a really nice hat, and he had to get over this wall. And he took his hat off, his beautiful hat, and he threw it over the wall. And the only way he could get it was by climbing that wall. The same things happened. When we accepted Jesus Christ, we threw everything over the wall, and we're not going back. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't feel like going back at times. Every one of us in this room and online, at some point in your life, you will feel like turning around and going back from where you came. That's a known fact. Amen? And, uh, and it will normally be on the days that you've had some of your toughest times or toughest days. 
uh, or challenges in life. Amen. I remember leaving Brooks in 1986. I moved to Mexico. I bought a Honda car because I wanted to be in one accord. And uh, I packed all my stuff that I had and I put it in that accord. And off we left for Mexico. And I lived there for two years in a little orphanage and served cleaning toilets and fixing cars and trucks and old things, preaching the gospel. Some of the best years of my life. But it was a turning point in my life where there was no turning back from. You know, there's many times in our lives that God will require us to do something we've never done before to achieve something we've never had before. Sitting waiting for God to do something will never happen. God requires that we step up and say, you know what? I'm going to throw my hat over that wall and climb that wall. I'm going to just sell my company and I'm going to get in a Honda car and I'm going to move to Mexico where I've never been and I'm going to live in an orphanage for two years and just see what happens to me. Change your life. The reason Christians, I believe, get bogged down is because they keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. You know the definition of an insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Some of the most bored Christians I know in the world are people who are unwilling to take a risk. But do you know that the definition of faith is? It's actually risk. If you're going to follow God, you must risk something. Amen? And, uh, and that's gonna, God is going to require faith for you to move into the next part of your life. I recently went to uh, Nigeria in May. Uh, Teresa was going to come with us, and maybe you'll come on the next trip that we go. But uh, there was an, quite a bit of risk involved in it, different factors that were involved. I went with Pastor Paul uh, Essien, who was here in this church for some time. And uh, we went over to Nigeria to see the work that he's done there. It was incredible. When we got off the plane in Nigeria, there was crowds waiting for us with flowers, singing, people kneeling down, people crying as we came onto the airstrip. Couldn't believe it. He is loved in his nation. He's the founder of churches all through that nation. Amen? And respected as an apostle in Nigeria. Revered and loved in Nigeria. And I had the privilege of spending uh, the next two weeks there with him. Amen? Even the governor of the state that we were in knows him personally and married him and his wife. And we sat in his office, in his governor's office. We had supper in the governor's mansion with him. And we were at his inauguration as the new governor of their state with 60,000 people sitting with his grandchildren in the VIP lounge. That's just a little bit of what happened when we were in Nigeria. Amen? So stepping out and taking a risk on doing something that you've never done before to experience something you've never experienced before is absolutely critical for a Christian to get to the next phase of their life. Somebody said this as well, a good quote from a realtor actually in Grand Prairie, is a friend of mine, Lori Rohde. And she said this, she said, your greatest life is on the other side of your greatest fear. I'll say it again. Your greatest life is just on the other side of your greatest fear. I would write that one down. Just think about the thing that you fear the most could be the very thing that God is requiring you to step over that line. What do you think the children of Israel feared when Goliath was standing there day after day after day, mocking them and mocking God? What do you think their greatest fear was? Where do you think their greatest life was? Just on the other side of the giant. But did anybody act on their fear, against that fear? Not one. It took a shepherd boy coming to feed his brothers who mocked him to stand up against Goliath and say, who do you think you are defying the armies of the Lord? You uncircumcised Philistine. In other words, you're not a covenant man. Who do you think you're talking to? And this young shepherd boy gets his sling and whacks him and kills him. Because he knew, here's the deal. David didn't see the giant. David saw his destiny on the other side of him. 
You have to see your greatest life and destiny just on the other side of the very thing that is stopping you before you'll experience it. I had no desire to go to Nigeria. I fought going to Nigeria. Teresa knows that. In fact, I, I said to him, Pastor Paul, I said uh, two weeks before, uh, I had a prophecy. I, I said, I'm not going to Nigeria. And I actually asked Pastor Morris Watson to go in my place. Two weeks later, I go to a meeting with Jeremiah Nelson, prophet from South uh, San Diego in um, Abundant Life Church here in Edmonton. I was invited to come up and share a little bit about the north and what we're doing in northern Canada. And so I shared my little bit. And uh, then Jeremy uh, called me up and he said, you, go to Nigeria! <laughs> I just told Paul two weeks before, I'm not going to Nigeria. Well, I texted Paul that night and I said, I'm going to Nigeria. <laughs> so your greatest life is just on the other side of your greatest fear. Amen? Anybody kind of get that? That's really important to see that. So when you and I accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we crossed over a line of no return. Amen. Drawn between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Amen. And who we are now on this side of the line. Listen to 1 Peter 2.9. This is who we are on the other side of the line. Now I was a, a drinking, womanizing, pool shark, street fighting, race car, long hair, kind of cowboy boots on, long hair. I, was, I didn't know if I was a cowboy or a hippie or what I was. I was so confused. Uh, race 69 Mach 1s and, and just a crazy guy. But I was on that side of the line. September 15th, 1979, when I walked up to an altar about 9 o'clock at night at the Heritage Motel in Brooks, Alberta, and went to the front and accepted Jesus, my life was completely transformed. I can't explain it, but I was completely changed. I wasn't this person on this side of the line anymore. I stepped over a line of no return. Amen? First Peter says this, and this is what happened, but you now are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, my, God's own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Wow! From one second to be an absolute invalid rebel to becoming a royal priesthood in a matter of seconds. Amen? And, uh, I mean, what do you do with that? Completely changed. Amen? Completely changed in a moment. And I stepped over a line that uh, was not a returnable line. Acts 26, 18 says this, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified or set apart by faith in God. Wow. So you're set apart. When you become born again, you're set apart. Your desires for this world and the things of this world die. I can walk through the West Edmonton Mall and there's not one thing in there I want. Amen? It doesn't appeal to me anymore. It doesn't mean that I can't buy a few things and I think we bought a couple things. But what is the pull of the world still on your heart? And that's an important question this morning. How much is the world pulling on your heart? How much do you need all this stuff that the world can offer you? Amen? And we've got to ask that question in this hour because we live in such a materialistic age. I think the entertainment industry has become a complete distraction for most people in the world. I believe the world's using entertainment to distract us and keep us away from the things of God. From missions, from doing things that are meaningful and eternal. Amen? I don't know how many sports games I've gone to, but my team never, never wins. And I think there's a reason for it. It just doesn't matter. Now, I'm not against, there's many Christians that are in sports and whatnot, but what is the thing that's drawing you away 
from a dedicated life with God, walking with him. You know, I had a guy, we had a coffee house in, uh, this story came to me as we were worshiping this morning, and I thought, well, maybe I'll tell it, maybe I won't. But uh, years ago in Brooks, born and raised in Brooks, Alberta, on the farm, and uh, when I, we got born again then, we, we said, well, we got to do something. So look at all these young people in Brooks that aren't saved. So we took an old butcher shop downtown Brooks. We transformed it into a, a we called it the Cornerstone Coffee House. We had a neon light, like a long one on the wall. Cornerstone. Man, we were the coolest place in all of Brooks. And we'd pack that place out every weekend. And we, uh, we sold uh, um, a cheese uh, tacos and all kinds of things, uh, microwave foods and stuff. And we got bands in from Edmonton, from YWAM, from wherever we could find them. And we would pack that place out with youth. And one Saturday morning, um, I was just cleaning the tables and in there. was a guy walked in and uh, he looked at me kind of funny and the music was blaring in the background I was singing away ah, and they're wiping the tables and just praising God and and uh and I turned the music down enough so that we could talk and I looked at him and I said do you know what the definition of a fanatic is it's someone who loves God more than you do and do you know what he was thinking when he was looking at me when he walked in the room he said what a fanatic and God answered him right back of who a fanatic is. Do you know where that young man is today? He got married, got born again. He got married. Now he's a missionary aviation uh, pilot in Papua New Guinea and serving Jesus. Amen? So yes, we are fanatics for Jesus. David was a fanatic when he danced before the Lord and his wife, uh, Michael, despised him. You know, people, even your family members could despise you for loving Jesus more than they do. They probably will. Amen? And so, there is a cost to following Jesus, isn't there? There is a cost to following Him. And there are challenges as we go. So we're living in a time and season where God is requiring that every person make a clear choice to whom they're going to serve and follow. It's a clear choice. It can't be a foggy choice. Have you noticed lately, the gray is gone. It's black or white. Amen. There used to be a lot more grace, but the grace is, it seems like it's gone. It's just black or white. You're serving or you're not. And it's a time when we need to make up our mind. And I believe today we need to pray a prayer together. Lord, I'm going with you. There's nowhere else to go. Amen. I'm going with you. Joshua said, uh, in in uh, Joshua 24, 15, he said, As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Period. What's that look like? That means there's prayer in the home. That means we go to church on Sunday. That means we, 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 we don't give our tithe. We actually return it. We give offerings. We do all the things that we know scripturally to do. And then we let God do the rest. Amen. And so living for the Lord. I think there's a time right now where a lot of people are being tempted and going back. And we know in the last days there will be a great falling away in the church. And now with all the sexual perversion and stuff that's coming into the church and being accepted by the church, there is a line being drawn of which side of that line you and I are going to walk on. And it's a critical line, very important line that is in the sand right now. So Joshua had stepped across a line of no return along with his family, and there was no turning back. And here's an interesting thought. If there's a back door to anything in your life, you will always take it in a time of crisis. Get rid of the doors. If there's a back door in your marriage, even the hint of a back door, you'll take it. There's no back door in our marriage. That's why we have to work things out. That's what covenant is. Covenant, you are forced to work out your issues. Amen? No back doors in our lives. And removing those back doors is very critical. So if what's ahead of you is not greater than what's behind you, you'll be tempted to turn back in a time of stress and trial. So if... Your dream is so small and puny that it's not worth living for or dying for. 
you'll probably turn back to your old ways. That's why it's important that we have a dream and a vision and a purpose in front of us that's far greater than anything behind us. Amen? When we went to Nigeria uh, with that prophecy of Jeremiah Nelson, he said he saw churches, multiple churches. He said 50 and then opened doors to, to, to many more things. Amen? So now all of a sudden at 67 years old, I've got a vision for all of West Africa for planting churches. That gets me up in the morning. And not only that, but we made a commitment to planting 50 churches in the north of Canada. 50. Amen? So we're up around, uh, I don't know, we're up around, uh, well, eight or nine, you know. It's going to take a little bit. But it's not my problem, it's God's. If our dream can be fulfilled by ourselves, it's probably not from God. It's your dream. Because God's dream will always have to be fulfilled in His strength. Zechariah 4.6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. When your power runs out and your might runs out, when you come to the end of your power and might is where God's power and might begins. Amen? And with Nigeria, I experienced that again. We had no ticket. We had no visa. We, I had no money for the trip. I said, Lord, you're going to have to come up with all this stuff if you want me to go to Nigeria. And then the roads were shut down because of the fires. Then WestJet was going on strike. Everything was against the trip going. And within the last week, even the visa coming in three or four days before we left, amen, God had to get me on that flight. He even had to solve a WestJet strike to get me to Nigeria. Isn't that awesome? And so you will have many obstacles to your dream. Many obstacles. But when God is with you, it's not by your might or power, but it's by His Spirit. He'll make sure it gets done. And that's so exciting to live that way. So it's important that what's ahead of us is greater than what's behind us. Remember, you don't have a rearview mirror on the side of your head. Amen? And that's very important. Matthew 19, 16 and 26 here talks about the rich young ruler. And I won't uh, read it actually. But he turned back. Jesus offered the rich young ruler everything. And he looked at what he had and compared it and thought it was greater. You know what? <laughs> Nothing we have is worth what God has for us. Nothing. No bank account, no car, no house, no investment, no business, no nothing. Amen? And the rich young ruler, it said that he turned away. Amen? And Jesus was vexed in his heart because he loved that young man. He turned back. In John 6, 63, uh, 66, John 6, 66, from the time, it says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Can you imagine? Jesus himself had his disciples in the multitudes of them turning away and walking away from him. And his regular 12 disciples stayed and he asked them, aren't you guys going to go too? And they said, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. So don't think that just because the crowd is doing something that you're going in the right direction. In fact, we learned in, Af in Africa where we lived in East Africa for four years that if there was a crowd, you ran the opposite way of the crowd because the crowd was probably going to kill someone. And it could have been you. So we would run the opposite way the crowd was going. And thank God we did. And sometimes you have to be that way. Like David, you need to stand, even if you have to stand alone, and go another way. If you're going to follow the Lord. So Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, Jesus, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is where? Before us. It's not behind us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what was before Jesus? Not sorrow, joy. Why joy? Because he saw you and me coming to his kingdom. The joy that was set before me hung on that cross. 
Isn't it interesting? While Jesus was on the cross, he wasn't thinking about himself. You know what he was thinking about? He was thinking about the people that were down there that, weren't sa- that were going to get saved. He was thinking about the thieves that were beside him. And the one thief gave his life to him. Isn't it interesting that the one thief just mocked Jesus and yet the other one received Jesus? It's a picture of all the human race. And the one that loved Jesus and said, remember me, would rather hang on the cross with Jesus any day than try to ask him to take him off. Because the other thief says, take us off here, get us out of here. Isn't it interesting? Many people are only interested in Jesus and what they can get from him. The other thief didn't want anything from Jesus. He just said, remember me. And he was saved. Jesus said, this day you'll go to paradise with me. And then he hung with Jesus. He would rather hang with Jesus on those nails and stay with him until he died knowing that he would be with him for eternity. Amen. An incredible scene. So it says that he was filled with joy. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says that eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who, who, who love him. Do you know there's a lot of Christians that actually don't love Jesus? They're angry at him because they haven't answered a pray for, prayer for him. It, it signifies here that this is going to happen for people who love him. Now I'm working on that because I want to be found loving him when I meet him. Many won't. It's preserved for those who love him. Amen? Amen? And so that's very, very important. We need to read it in that light. So what's ahead of us, and, or me, you and me, is far greater than what's behind us. And what we are becoming is far greater than what we have ever been before. God is always the God of increase and not, uh, not depletion. Amen? The only power you and I have for today is determined most by the vision we have for tomorrow. I, I, I drive my wife crazy sometimes because of my vision. She says, Paul, that's enough vision. Shut up. Stop telling me so much vision. We're, you know, we're selling the house. We're moving to in Timbuktu, you know. We're, you know. You know, living as a visionary leader is exciting. It really is. But it does drive our wives crazy at times. Because women tend to be more settlers. Amen? That's right. You need to know what to be pregnant with. So we know that our vision empowers us. Habakkuk 2, 1 and 3 says to run with it. It empowers us to run. If you're going to be a person who finishes well, your dream ahead of you will have to consume you more than the memories of your past. When I got born again, my wife at the time with our little baby, she said, I'm sorry I didn't marry a preacher. Bye-bye. And divorced me a year later. What's it cost you to follow Jesus? Amen? Look at people in other countries, what they suffer when they come to Christ. We as Canadians are some of the most blessed people on the earth. And that's why it's so important that as Canadians, we get out of Canada, out onto the mission field, and actually see what's actually going on out there. We're such a small portion of the... Of the uh, population on the face of the earth. Do you know what Nigeria's population is? 222 million. One country the size of the state of Texas. And they think, they're saying this, there are over 500 million Nigerians in the world. Half a billion that are going to affect and transform this world before Jesus comes. They are so passionate. Do you know they dance for an hour for the offering? We want to be out of church in an hour, but, but there they dance for an hour with the governor in the governor's church. There he was dancing, going to, the, going to the offering plates, you know. And he had a great big basket there. Everybody was dropping in. They didn't stop until the thing was full of money. 
and the horns were tooting and the band was playing and everybody was shouting and everybody was dancing. All the children, all the moms, all the grandmas, people on their crutches dancing for an hour just for the offering. And we're checking our watch because we got lunch. Amen? That's why we need to be exposed to stuff like that. We need to get delivered from churchiosity and, and, and setting, the, setting the timetable for God instead of God setting the timetable for us. Amen? It's so important. Now that's a bit over the wall for most of us here, but we lived in Africa, so we love that. But when we come here, you know I feel sorry for Nigerians that are living in Canada. I really am. When I see what's over there, I feel sorry for them because we are so dead compared to them. And we're not exuberant, but that's kind of our culture in Canada. Our culture in Canada is we're all we're just prim and pauper. Everything's good and perfect, you know. Man. They had one little guy. He came up and brought his offering. And he just did a jig and a dance there for about 10, 15 minutes. Place went crazy. I better stop. So if you're going to be a person who finishes well, you will have to become consumed with more than the memories of your past. Instead, you're going to have to be consumed with your dream. And if you don't have a dream, ask God for one. And if you, if you don't have a dream, serve somebody else's dream and vision until God gives you your own. You will be inspired by a leader who has a dream and a vision. And in that inspiration, God will give you your own dream. Luke chapter 16 teaches that. Amen? Get around people that dream and watch what happens to you. We're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spirit beings having a human experience. And it's only temporary. It's not permanent. So I guess the question this morning is, how are you enjoying your human experience here on earth? How are you, how are you enjoying your spirit, your human experience here on earth as a spirit being? Because we're spirit first, amen? And then we live in a body and we have a soul. But we are a spirit being that will never die. Here's the deal. Your spirit, this is really interesting. Your spirit is the breath of God. When he created Adam, he didn't actually create Adam, he formed him. There's one verse that talks about creating as well, but it's more accurate that he actually formed Adam. And then he formed Eve out of Adam's rib. So he actually with his hands molded supernaturally them into being. And then they were just bodies laying there. And it says that he breathed his spirit or his breath. The word spirit and breath are the same word. He breathed his spirit and breath into mankind. Your spirit is the breath of God. Man, if you kind of think about that, it's amazing. Why does God love us so much? Because we're a part of Him. We're a part of Him. Why does it, why does it, why is He not willing that any perish without Him? Because that person goes to hell for eternity. A part of God goes to hell. Can you imagine that? Now that's a whole other teaching. That you don't hear on Sunday morning very often. I better stop on that one, but wow. But my spirit inside is just rejoicing. And when I get around the things of God, my spirit comes alive. Why does it come alive? Because it's partly God. He's in me. My spirit is from Him. Woohoo! That's what Christianity is. Christianity is not sitting in a pew on a Sunday morning. Christianity is living for Jesus every day. Being that river of living water that wherever it flows, it brings refreshing wherever it goes. It brings life. It brings fruit. That's who we are as Christians. Amen? And we can transform the world with that river of living water that's gushing out of our inner being. Amen? And that's what it means to be a Christian, wherever we go. You change the atmosphere when you walk in the room. 
Just your presence, the presence of God in you. When you walk into a room, you change the atmosphere. That's a whole nother message. So just remember, it's not your only, it's not your, this isn't our only experience. We have another experience on the other side that's going to be so much greater. Hebrews 10.35, therefore do not cast away your confidence. And I'm finishing now. Say he's finishing. He's finishing. Do not cast away your confidence, your boldness. The book of Proverbs says that the righteous are as bold as what? As bold as what? We have to find our lion heart again. We were little sheepies when we were sinners. But now as born again believers, I believe that we are more like the lion of Judah than the lamb of God. Jesus only came as a lamb to save lambs who were lost. If Jesus came as a lion to save lambs, we would have all run away. He emptied himself of everything that he was and he became a lamb, the lamb of God, but only to save us so that we could get our lion heart back that we lost in the Garden of Eden when we sinned. What was the first thing Adam did after he sinned? He hid himself. Lions don't hide from anyone, but lambs do. And Satan acts like a lion, and we act like sheep. Do you know that sheep are some of the dumbest animals in the world? They'll just walk over a cliff into water, drown themselves. Come on, people. That's what sin did to us. But we are not lambs forever. I believe that God wants to get our lion heart back, our roar back inside of us so that we can change the world like Nigeria is doing. Change the world. I've never seen so much wealth as I saw in Nigeria. I came home with more money in my pocket than I left with. People were stuck in... $100 US bills in my pocket, giving me things. I had new clothes every day, handmade for me to go and preach in that evening. Beautiful Nigerian clothes. I was put up in the nicest hotels. I don't even know who paid for them. I had a taxi, beautiful vehicle every day with a driver named Emmanuel. Interesting having a driver named Emmanuel. God with us. Amen. This is everything that God did. I didn't do any of it. And we think that we're advanced in Canada? No, I'm sorry, we're not. You go to Latin America churches. Go to Argentina where they had revival. Amen? There's a church in Nigeria right now, I'll finish. Church in Nigeria that they're building called the Ark. It seats 100,000 people in one city. It's only half built and it's already paid for. This is Africa, people. You think Africa's poor? Much of it is. But I think in many ways Canada is more poor. Because we think we have it and we actually don't. That's what I... I mean, it's hard coming home and saying that. But that's the truth. Amen. And that's why we need to travel. That's why you need to get out to Thailand and see your guy out there. What's his name? Yeah, Marty. Get out there and see Marty and... Help Al Purvis out and those guys. Who is it? Harley picked me up at the airport one time in his old green car. Yeah. And uh, now he's over there. He's married, got kids and everything. And they're having the time of their life. Amen. So important. So we don't retire. We transition. We transition from one season to the next. We're not, Jan and I aren't retiring. We're transitioning to this place, to that place, from glory to glory to glory to glory. Why would we want to just retire and die within two years like most people that do? If you have no dream or vision, there's no reason for you being here. Amen? That's the truth. And humans can't live without a purpose. And that's so true. We need to find that and go for that. Say he's finishing. Verse 36, it says, For you have need of endurance in Hebrews so that uh, 10, after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by, by risk. The just shall live 
by risk. The just shall live by risk. Amen? We're going to Mexico on Wednesday. Woohoo! We got a base down there in Ensenada, Mexico. Five, seven hundred, maybe between five and seven hundred thousand people living in Ensenada. We're a thousand feet above sea level in our missions base there that we planted there a few years ago. And the whole city is just there in front of us. What an excitement. We just built a senior's home there. We found so many old people under the bridges there that were dying. We built a senior's home for it. Amen. 300,000 plus dollars just came in just like that. I don't even know where it came from. Boom. And it's built. And these old people are all giving their lives to Jesus. See, the moment you move, God moves. Smith Wigglesworth said this. He said, God, if you're not moving, I will move you. How is God moved? God is moved by our faith. The centurion in the Bible, didn't, he wasn't even a Jew. It says he gave alms, he prayed with his family. Amen? And God recognized him to the point where he sent his highest apostle, Peter, to go and visit that man. Because God was attracted to his giving and to his love for people. What is God attracted to in your life? I guess we have to ask that question. What is he attracted to in our lives? Amen. What in our life right now requires faith? Is there anything? Or are we just living off, off the cusp most of the time? Amen. Amen. Sometimes I think we just need to give it all away like the rich young ruler and just watch what God does. Fly or die. Amen? Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, listen, anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in them. But we are not of those who would draw back to perdition but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So faith sees beyond everything that we are facing. The two guys in the prison were looking up at the, at the wall and there were some bars up above and the one man that was there in the prison, all he saw was the bars. You've probably heard this story. But the other guy was there and guess what he saw? He saw the stars. And that's the way most of us are. We either see stars or bars. I choose to see stars. I don't care what happens in my life. When my wife left me with my little baby girl, I chose to see stars. And God has taken me around the world many times. Planted churches all over the north. Raised up a base in, in, in Sedata, Mexico. Have students all over the continent of Africa preaching the gospel. Because I chose to see the stars. And I'm not bragging. I'm bragging on God. I chose to see the stars and not the limitations. And that's what God wants to do in your life today. Faith always looks ahead. Fear always looks back. Faith and patience. We will inherit the promises. Now I'm going to read in Luke 9.62 and then we're closing. Powerful verse in the Passion. It says, Jesus responded, Why do you keep looking back at your past and have second thoughts about following me? Second thoughts. We've all had them. We've all had them. Satan has told us lies about ourselves, about our future and our past, and he stopped us dead in our tracks, and we're just paralyzed, and we don't know what to do. Well, today we're going to step over a line. Jesus responded, why do you keep looking back at your past and have second thoughts about following me? If you turn back, you are not fit for the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean that you can't go to heaven. It just means that you can't work the works of the kingdom here on earth. It's like going to a football game in your pajamas. You're not fit. Jesus prayed, let your kingdom come to where? The earth. Adam and Eve were to establish the kingdom of God on the earth, and they failed. God gave Israel... 
the responsibility of establishing the kingdom of God on the earth, and they failed. Every person that God gave the, the purpose of establishing his kingdom on earth all failed. So who did he send finally? He sent his son. And his son prayed. He said, Father, let your kingdom come on the earth as it is in heaven. And he wants us to be a part of that, of establishing his kingdom on the earth. He doesn't need his kingdom in heaven established. It's done. He wants it done here. And he's not willing that any perish, but that all come to him. We know that they're all not. But he said, try anyway. Preach anyway. Give anyway. Love anyway. It doesn't matter what they say or do to you. Follow me. And I'll make you, he said. I'll make you. He'll make us if we just follow him. The easiest thing we can do is just say, Jesus, I want to follow you. Do you want to just put your hand on your heart and just close your eyes where you are right now? Say this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. Your word never returns void, but it will accomplish everything that's been sent to do. Even in my own heart today, I realize that I've had second thoughts, times of fear, times of hopelessness, I have looked back at times. But Lord, today, I want to ask your forgiveness for even considering that in my life. There's nothing to go back to. There's nothing. Lord, you have the words of eternal life. And I choose today to step over that line, to put my hand to the plow and not look back ever again. Give me grace to do so. In Jesus' precious name, I ask you, Lord, today to cause the dream that I was born for to be ignited in my heart once again. Forgive me for fear, doubt, and unbelief. For believing lies that has stopped me from going after the dream and destiny and purpose that I was born for. I thank you, Lord, today for empowering me for doing so. This is the greatest day of my life. I'll never return by the grace of God back to what I was. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that it's by your power that you will make this all possible. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen.